Um, his name's Alex Chesler, um, fabulous mentor and colleague and friend. Um, he transitioned to NCCIH as a Stadman investigator after his postdoc. And um, fun fact that he actually taught me how to do my first um, immunohistochemical staining on ganglion section. So <laughs> it kind of came full circle. So at NIH, Alex had been working with Dr. Carson Bonneman to study a cohort of subjects that lacked the functional piezo 2 mechanoreceptor. So these patients carried loss of function variants in the gene. Um, in other words, they had inactivating compound variants. So on examination, the most impactful deficit affecting the patient's daily lives is their complete loss of proprioception. So when they're blindfolded, the patients have profound difficulty walking and standing. In a separate reaching task in which they're asked to touch an external point than their nose, and you can do this yourself with your eyes closed, I'm quite certain. So these P is a two subjects could perform this task nearly as well as controlled when their eyes are open, but when they're blindfolded, they had difficulty finding their own nose. So this was all in addition to having a complete absence of touch sensation um, coming from their skin. They also lacked two-point discrimination. So when I was reviewing these observations, my immediate question was, how has the loss of function in this particular ion channel affected their ability to use their mouths? I mean, so obviously these are structures that we're moving, they're moving without being able to see. And our mouths are profoundly sensitive to touch, especially if you think about the lips, you know, and the tongue as well. So Alex had been thinking about this and he was really excited that I could contribute. And I have to admit that <laughs> typically most people aren't so excited to see a dentist. So that was a nice change. So when thinking about studying sensation with these subjects, I designed a simple sensory assay. The idea was that you can apply a force to the front of the incisor and you can ask the subject if they can detect it. So gentle, gentle touch with a normal subject, it's remarkably easy for them to detect. So what you're seeing in this bar graph, it represents the fractions of a gram. So that's a little more than the weight of a feather. But subjects without functional piezo to probably wouldn't detect a wooden dowel if it were rammed into their teeth. So 300 grams represents the largest bone filament that we use for this particular test. And most subjects actually reported hearing it, but not actually being able to feel it. So clearly the structure of the tooth and the surrounding tissues is capable of sensing light touch. And that depends on functioning piezo 2. But to me, this still leaves open the question as to whether or not the neurons innervating the tooth or those surrounding structures are actually relaying this information. And most importantly, this got me wondering what the neurons that are innervating the teeth are doing at all. So we might expect there that the neurons that innervate the teeth can trigger severe pain. And I wouldn't deny that. I and mean, it seems the majority of my clinical practice as a dentist is meant to alleviate or prevent tooth pain. But I bet that as you're sitting there, you and I hardly notice our teeth at all. So realistically, the question is why are the teeth innervated? What's the normal sensation that we get from our teeth? I think this question is really important because answering it may help us to understand how sensation goes from subconscious to agonizing. And the idea would be that somehow with that information, we could intervene. So before we move forward and think about tooth sensation, even we're, if we're in a pain interest group, I think we're gonna have a mixed audience as far as research interests. So what I wanna do is make sure we're all on the same page with somatic sensation to begin. And also I wanted, I wanted to say that if there's things that I don't tell you that you'd like to know or you wanna talk about, you can just interrupt and ask. You know, This can be as informal as we'd like it to be. So the somatosensory system is a collection of neurons outside the central nervous system that is responsible for detecting the internal and external environment. Sensory neurons reside in ganglia along the spinal cord, DRG, or at the base of the skull, TG, trigeminal ganglia, and they send, each of those neurons send two projections from a common stalk. 
one to the target tissues in the periphery and one to the spinal cord of the brainstem, depending on whether or not it's the DRG or TG. So these neurons are responsible for detecting a wide array of stimulation and are thus considerably heterogeneous. Typically, the neurons have been classified by their diameter and their degree of myelination. Let me get my laser pointer up. I've sort of been doing this without it. So smaller diameter cells are typically thought of as pain sensing. People have tried to classify them based on their expression of the trip channels that I know so well. Larger neurons, large neurons are thought to play a role in gentle touch and proprioception. And the medium neurons, medium diameter neurons are somewhere in between. This is a simplification of the classification within this system. And it's based primarily on studies of skin innervation. But regarding the teeth, it's generally thought that innervation consists of small and medium diameter neurons. Sorry about that. <clears throat> so I started my postdoc with the Reba lab at the perfect time for understanding these neurons in the trigeminal ganglion. The group just developed the transcriptomic data set for these cells and it shifted our understanding of the neurons in total. So what we saw was that based on expression patterns, neurons clustered into a little over a dozen finite number of classes. So you can see this on the plot to the right. Here, individual neurons are represented as dots and neurons with similar expression patterns clustered together. So these data also revealed that the general classifications that we relied on aren't so hard and fast. And that's to say that single markers don't always delineate a single cluster of neurons. And I think, especially for me, this was an important shift in the way that I thought about what constitutes a functional class of neurons. But as great as all this is, we still face a key limitation with the transcriptomic data, and it's completely out of context. So the cells are dissociated to do this, and so their position in the ganglion and their connection with peripheral tissues is completely lost. So we might have all the transcriptional information, but we have no information about the target tissues in this way. So we developed a way to get the transcriptomic information back into the tissue sections. What we found is that we could use the expression patterns of only 15 genes to predict transcriptomic class. So another way of putting this, particular patterns of expression in C2 is highly predictive of transcriptomic class. So in this heat map on the top, each class on the y-axis can be defined by the expression of a few genes along the bottom. So we probed for these markers in tissue sections using multi-round, multiplex, and C2 hybridization, and we were able to assess the, assess the expression patterns in each neuron. So here we have a single section imaged in multiple rounds, then aligned. And I think you can appreciate that we get a tremendous amount of information when we do this technique. And to illustrate this further, I'm showing the same ganglion section. Now I'm showing pairwise comparison of the 15 markers. At two comparisons per second, it still takes about a minute to see all 105. So what I would say is that I like this technique to study the ganglion and sections, but it's quite generalizable to other tissues as well. Um, and the basis for it is hybridization chain reaction. Um, so we've probed the neurons and sections, now we can assign the transcriptomic class. We also found that if, if we use the machine learning algorithm, it actually makes it easier for us and only necessitates using eight genes instead of, instead of 15 markers. So here's a color-coded section down at the bottom, demonstrating class assignment, the section you saw on the preceding slide. And to reiterate, the class assignment reproduces the clusters and classification that we saw based on the transcriptomic data. So now the last barrier is that we just need to tie this in vitro classification back to target tissues. And when I say this, I'm thinking about the teeth. So we can do this via retrograde tracing to label the cells before in C2 hybridization class assignment. So here we have a cartoon of the trigeminal ganglion system, the sensory system. So we have the TG here. Okay, it's in the base of the skull, and that's usually in the middle cranial fossa. It's hard to see from this angle, but the main point is that the ganglion sits here. It has three main divisions, which correspond to three of its branches, ophthalmic, maxillary, and mandibular. The mandibular branches carry axons that innervate multiple tissues, including the mandibular molars, all right, which in this cartoon, the tooth depicted as completely evolved, and even for you non-dentists, you can appreciate that that's not the typical position for the tooth. So that the idea is to make a small cavitation of the tooth 
apply a retrograde label conjugated to a fluorescent dye. And this label interacts with a moiety on the cell surface. And it's then transported back to the cell body. So the label then reveals the sensory neurons that target the tooth. So as a dentist, I work on human patients. But I thought I should try my hand at a bit of mouse dentistry. So here I'm showing that I achieved single tooth resolution using this label, labeling strategy in the maxillary arch here. Here's the hard palate with the rugae or the mandibular arch. Here we have the tongue. So I can also use pulled glass micropipettes to inject dye into tissue such as the palate or the tongue. So yeah, as you can see, I can use this method to label sensory neurons that innervate other oral tissues as well, as well, even though I'm only going to be talking about the, the molar neurons today. So after application of the dye, what can we see in the ganglion? We see robust labeling of cell bodies of sensory neurons innervating the teeth. <clears throat> so to orient you, we're looking at the trigeminal ganglion from the top. Coincidentally, it seems to resemble the state of Michigan. I think you'd, you'd think it looks like Michigan more than Wisconsin, at least. That'd be my guess for the Minnesotans. Um, so the ganglion's been embedded in a gel, and then it's cleared, and that allows us to image it in whole mount format using light sheet microscopy. So in this particular image, in this reconstruction, we have the maxillary and mandibular molars are labeled with separate dyes. So you can appreciate that there's a substantial number of neurons that innervate the teeth. And for each arch, what we see is the neurons localized roughly into the expected divisions. Um, although I would say that the separation between these isn't so neatly defined as in the anatomy text, that there's a bit of an overlap. When we label adjacent teeth, we see that the neurons are interspersed, and that suggests little topographical organization at this level of the system. And furthermore, I can tell you that I find a variability in the absolute position of these neurons in the ganglion when we do labeling between animals or among animals, and that suggests there's sort of a st stochastic nature to the way that the, the ganglion develops. But the last bit I'd like to point out is that these neurons seem to be quite large, and they're all fairly uniform in size. So here's another image of these neurons compared to those that innervate palate in the bottom row. So in this comparison, I think it's clear that the neurons that innervate the molars are large and uniform compared to those that innervate a different oral tissue. And I think this was our first hint that our expectations about the innervation of the teeth might be incorrect. So with all of our labeling, we can quantify the number of neurons innervating each tooth, and that's approximately 50. So each tooth has a dedicated set of neurons, um, and that's indicated by a lack of co-labeling from dye placed on adjacent teeth, so unique dyes placed on adjacent teeth. For perspective, if we're thinking about the mouse and we're thinking about the whisker pad, it's an incredibly important sensory structure that the mouse relies on. Each whisker receives innervation from a similar number of neurons. I think we would conclude that that's fairly rich innervation. Um, and I, I think it begs the question, are the teeth acting as some sort of important sensory structure? So to start to explore this, we wanted to ask about the identity of these neurons. So we can look at the classification of the neurons that innervate other craniofacial structures for reference. Um, for these, we apply the retrograde dye to each tissue and use our in situ classification strategy. If we look at the cornea, what we would consider a very specialized structure. We can see that it's innervated by a variety of classes, and these classes include feet, fibrinose receptors as well, <clears throat> and, and those are represented by the yellow and the cyan pie slices. What would we expect about the neurons that innervate the molars? So we also predict, we could predict that we'd find many classes. It seems like most tissues are innervated by many classes of neurons. And some of those could be small diameter nose receptors that express different chip channels. But to my delight, that's not what we found at all. The innervation of the molars seems to be much simpler. Um, that's not to suggest it isn't remarkable. I think what's remarkable is that the transcriptomes of these neurons suggest they aren't small at all. Instead, the data indicate that the neurons are myelinated, or likely to be myelinated, fast conducting, and large diameter, and that's indicated by this blue ring. And so this size is consistent with, with what I showed previously in the imaging. When I look 
closer to these two classes. The majority are nociceptors, but not the kind that we've discussed. So very few of the pain sensing neurons that are the small T fiber type. <clears throat> also really interesting, most of these neurons express the mechanosensitive ion channel to the two, and this is the ion channel sensitive for light touch to remind you. Again, so why do we have such robust innervation that seems to be responsible for detecting mechanical forces? I mean, if we think about it, maybe it's that these are responsible for detecting forces that could injure the teeth. I mean, that would make a lot of sense. You're sitting there chewing during your lunch. Uh, usually I'm scarfing it down, rushing through. I mean, it'd make a lot of sense if the neurons here are equipped to detect untoward forces and then send this, this information rapidly along to help prevent damage, maybe by some reflex action. So with all this in mind, we set out to study the function of these neurons and determine if pulp neurons, in those that innervate the teeth, respond to various mechanical forces, and if any of these responses might depend on piezo2. So, to double back and think about piezo2 subjects, this seems to be fairly consistent with our initial observations. Um, and certainly it seems that some aspect of tooth sensation does depend on piezo2 based on our observations of these subjects. So as great as it is, and it has been, to be able to ask humans what they feel, we still need to rely on the mouse models to be able to ask which neurons are responding and what stimuli activate them. And I'll have to admit that performing these experiments does represent a significant challenge. First off, the ganglion, as we talked about, um, it's the collection of neurons that innervate the teeth in the periodontium. It's deep inside the cranium. Second, so we need to get to it. Second, we need a way to measure neural responses. Okay, so to solve the access and response issues, we set up a platform that allows us to expose the whole ganglion and visualize calcium influx of each neuron independently. And that serves as a proxy for activation. So I use the calcium indicator GCAMP6F. So when this protein binds calcium, it undergoes a conformational change that allows it to fluoresce. So there are several strategies to express this in neurons. I use viral vectors to transduce sensory neurons in this particular Cree-dependent mouse reporter line, and we get widespread stochastic expression of GCAM. So the neurons are set up, and now we just need to be able to image them. So again, the neurons are the base of the skull, but it turns out they're able to get direct access to these via window preparation. So the surgery is done under anesthesia, and it also results in the removal of both hemispheres and most of the pain processing centers of the forebrain. And essentially, that creates a, ter a terminal anesthesia, if you will. So we can use a low-power objective, and then we can visualize the sensory neurons at vivo. So I want to give you a sense of what this actually looks like. So here we have raw, unprocessed images of the TG. We're looking at the dorsal surface of the ganglion. At baseline on the left, we see very little fluorescence. But after I deliver a blunt mechanical force to the buccal mucosa, like the cheek, in, inside the cheek, we see that the neurons light up. So this is just a still frame. The true response is going to be transient. But mostly, all I'm showing is a group of principle that I can deliver a blunt stimulus and record a population of neurons that response. But the goal is to deliver stimuli to the teeth and record responses simultaneously from the neurons that innervate the teeth. So stimulation of the tooth is tricky. It's a very small space. I mean, you can imagine if you're looking at a mouse's mouth, mouth you're trying to stimulate the teeth. It takes some practice. Um, but honestly, finding the molar neurons out of the 10,000 cells in the ganglion, um, that's, that's a, an equally difficult barrier. So to find these molar neurons, I took advantage of the insulated nature of the tooth and used an electrical search. That is, I applied a pulse voltage to the intact enamel of a single tooth, causing current to flow through the molar so in these experiments, I perform three rounds of stimulation, and with each subsequent stimulation, I move the ground electrode around, and that changes the path of the current flowing through. So if a neuron responded to at least two rounds of pulsing, I categorize this, these as the molar neurons, or the pulp neurons. They're innervating the dental pulp, they're innervating the molar. Um, I'm using these terms synonymously. So after identifying these neurons, I can deliver additional stimulation to the tooth, and determine if these also elicit a response, and this allows me to ask if these neurons are tuned to detect one or more of a whole variety of stimulation. So I wanna provide some process videos to help emphasize what this looks like in imaging. 
In this video, we, we're going to be looking at the neurons of the surface of the ganglion again. So there's going to be a slight delay at the start, and then there are going to be pulses that are delivered to the tooth. So delay, and then now we have pulses delivered to the tooth. And this video is looped. So now it starts over, and the pulses begin. So you can see the neurons are synchronized to the stimulation. Uh, the other thing I'd like to note is the size of these neurons, especially those in focus. Again, they're, they're relatively large um, for what we've seen in the ganglion. And this, is, again, is consistent with our labeling and our transcriptomic classification. So we can take those neurons that respond to electrical pulses and follow them with other stimulation. So here I'll be showing responses to a very strong mechanical forces produced by drilling on the tooth. So we'll have a delay and then several events where touching the bird of the tooth. And we can see that the drilling triggers activation of many of the molar neurons, also a large number of neurons innervating other tissues. And, you know, it's interesting to look at these videos, but let me show you another way of looking at these data. So here's our stimulation paradigm over on the left, as well as a still frame of the response of multiple molar neurons. So another way to look at their electrical response is the heat map on the right. That shows each neuron on the y-axis over time on the x-axis with the normalized fluorescent responses in color. So blue to red gives increasing magnitude of response. So using this paradigm, we're able to reliably identify a subset of trigeminal neurons that we think represent the pulp neurons. So in this representation, the responses have this characteristic striation pattern, and that represents firing that's entrained to the stimulating frequency. So one other thing I'd like to point out here is that molar neurons typically respond electrical stimulation of only one tooth. So there's this larger training pattern because we're stimulating the first molar than the second and back to the first and so on and so forth. So this, consist this is consistent with our published study that suggests that each pulp is innervated by its own set of neurons. Um, it's also important to note that we have additional confidence that we're looking at the pulp neurons because most of these also respond to rapid cooling. And that's a pulp sensitivity test used by dentists. Um, which I'm aware of clinically as well as, as I've mentioned. So now that we're able to locate these neurons um, using this platform, we can ask how they and other trigeminal sensory neurons respond to subsequent mechanical stimulation. So as I mentioned, pulp neurons express piezo 2 um, and piezo 2 allows neurons to respond to gentle forces. So for me, it was obvious to first test direct forces applied to the two. So I, I depict these data in a similar way from now on, so it's worth orienting you. So these heat maps represent a single TG in a single experiment, and below I indicated consolidated counts, and if there's a bar graph, that shows the data for multiple experiments. The top portion of the heat map above the white line shows the pulp neurons as identified by the electrical search. The bottom portion shows other responders in the ganglion. Um, for each experiment after we perform the electrical search, then we apply stimulation directly to the molar teeth. And on these heat maps, immediately to the right of the search, we're visualizing the subsequent simulation. So like right here, essentially in this case. So we end each experiment with the rapid cooling. <clears throat> so looking at these data, I can tell you that it was quite surprising that we found that applying low, medium, and even high forces to the tooth failed to produce any responses from these pulp neurons. Whereas some neurons in the ganglion, and we might predict these to innervate the periodontium and respond. Knockout, this knockout actually worked, this conditional knockout actually worked. And although we saw a decrease in the, in the proportion of response to vibration, we did not see any decrease in the responses to drilling. And so that tells us that drilling um, is unlikely to be dependent on piezo 2. So, yeah, I think I want to take a look back at our piezo 2 cohort and, and we can think about this in context of them again. So from the data, we can begin to understand how the trigeminal system encodes different forces that the tooth encounters. The pulp neurons respond to damaging forces, but other forces like vibration and applied forces are encoded by neurons that innervate surrounding tissues. So this helps explain why we tend not to feel our teeth normally, like actually inside of our teeth in the pain. It also explains why the loss of piezo 2 in these subjects diminishes the ability to sense tooth touch. And it suggests that responses to these forces are, are probably dependent on piezo 2. But I would predict that these subjects still need dental anesthetic uh, prior to the dental procedures. Um, 
And I think that um, I'm going to conclude in the interest of time. Thank you so much, Dr. Amrik, and I'm sorry we can't. Um...